Thank, Thank you. Wow. And of course, she has impeccable timing. The Dean of the College of Education and Allied Studies just walked in, just as I was about to thank her. Uh, I really do want to extend a thank you uh, once again. I do every event, and she's earned it, certainly. Uh, a big thank you to Carolyn Nelson, Dean of the College of Education and Allied Studies, for her generous support of the Center for Sport and Social Justice. And uh, to the Department of Kinesiology as well. The department, since our inception in 2011, uh, has been uh, a huge fan of us in so many different ways. And they continue through the present and into the future with their support. So we are grateful to the Department of Kinesiology and its entire faculty and staff. Thank you. <laughs> One other quick thing. You'll notice that there are surveys uh, in the appropriate color purple or lavender, that's our center's colors. If you wouldn't mind filling that out after the presentation, and I guess just uh, maybe leaving it with Cody in the back or dropping it on your seat there, that would really be great. We appreciate your feedback about our events. Thanks. Finally now, on to Donna Duffy. Um, doc, Dr. Donna Duffy is an assistant professor in the Department of Kinesiology at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, where she teaches a wide range of courses from pedagogy to coaching to PE administration. She serves as the program coordinator for the undergraduate coaching education option in the major on that campus. In addition, she directs the program for the advancement of girls and women in sport and physical activity. She has been uh, and is uh, a principal investigator on a number of different research grants, um, some but not all related to her work on athletic coaching. And she just gave me updates on her veto, so I have to flip to the back, and I'm going to try I to read her to writing. But these are two really important accomplishments that I want to mention. In the past month, she's been awarded the Coleman Fellowship, uh, which supports faculty in an effort to integrate entrepreneurial skills and learning objectives into their coursework, and she's going to do that with her Foundations of Coaching class. The second award that she's been given in recent weeks is the Kohler Award, and this is to fund faculty for international travel to take their research agenda abroad uh, and to introduce it to folks and to share knowledge and get knowledge back on an international level. So congratulations. Thank you. Those Thank you. Awards. Those of us familiar with athletic culture, and I know there are plenty of you in the room, um, are also aware of the practice in which coaches employ language uh, that they claim will motivate athletes that is laced with profanity and can, in addition, be homophobic and sexually explicit or violent. Rather than positive and constructive, the tactics used by some coaches serves to humiliate and instill fear in athletes. In some instances, those in control of what happens within athletic spaces, parents, athletic leaders, etc., tolerate coaches' behavior or even encourage it. Such language would simply not be accepted in any other educational setting, yet it may not even raise an eyebrow when it happens on playing fields and athletic courts. Dr. Duffy's research is intent on changing that culture of coaches using use of derogatory or humiliating language to motivate their players. In part, her role as a field hockey coach for many years sparked her interest in the topic, and also the development of a workshop that she has created that she's going to be giving on our campus this afternoon at 4.30, entitled Coaching Coaches, an educational workshop to reduce and prevent sexually violent language in coaching. Hundreds of coaches and athletic administrators have completed the workshop with a vast majority indicating that the information gained in the session will help them do their jobs both differently and better. Given Dr. Duffy's commitment to challenging existing practices in sport that demean, marginalize, and silence participants, we are thrilled that she accepted our invitation to come to campus today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Duffy. Thank you so much. I'm going to move this. Is that okay? Well, thank you very much. I'm extremely honored to be here. Very happy. I've never been to this part of the country before. Um, so it was the first time I flew into San Francisco and have had just such a great experience with being here so far. So thank you very much. And thanks, you, thanks to the center for bringing me in. Um, I'll, uh, just a couple of, um, well, I guess a quick disclosure. I've never been 
invited to speak anywhere before except here. So, you know, it's a very interesting thing, right? Because when you start your academic work, when you start your career as a faculty member, you're sending in abstracts left and right to every conference you can get your hand on. Please accept me. And so sometimes you do and sometimes you don't, right? You get those opportunities. Well, when I got invited to speak here, I thought, well, this is great. You know, maybe I can stop sending in abstracts now, but I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> I think that's something I'm still going to have to do on a, on a pretty regular basis. So thank you very much. And forever, in terms of my academic history, you'll be my first invited talk. So that's good. And I'll make sure I let all the other people who follow after you know, let them know that I was here first. So um, today I want to talk to you just a little bit about um, the out, what we learned from a program that we developed. And I do have a long history in coaching a long history with coaching, specifically field hockey, but I grew up in a coaching family. My, my grandfather was one of the very first, was the first uh, football coach in the town that we grew up in. My grandmother was the first um, cheerleading coach. She started that program. I grew up in a family of coaches. Um, my uncles, my aunts, my mother, everybody. Coaching, 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 athletics, 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 right? So, and growing up in my world, actually, I was expected to be an athlete. There was no question about it. Any other interest that I could have potentially had, like the flute, was not an option. <laughs> Put it down, go to practice kind of thing. That was what it was. So I've been in athletics for a long time and have coached high school field hockey for about 24 years. Um, and do a little bit of work with USA Field Hockey through our, our program at UNCG. Um, so I've been very fortunate to have these experiences. And one of the things I've learned is I've, I've had these experiences is that these spaces where we send kids, where we send adults, where we send young adults to participate and hopefully learn some of what we sometimes consider the byproducts of sport participation, like teamwork and being more cooperative, higher levels of efficacy and self-esteem. Sometimes those things are compromised if the program or the organization or the athletic department is using a language, and language creates a culture, doesn't it? Is using a language that is derogatory in nature. And one of the things I started to figure out as I got a little bit older, as I got some more education underneath my belt and I started to teaching and started doing more research is that a lot of these spaces are not conducive for these things. They're not conducive for learning. So I kind of took a step back and said, what am I going to do? Because I love athletics. I grew up in athletics. It's how I identify myself. What am I going to do about this? Because this space that I love may not be safe anymore because of the way that I was changing because of the way my thinking was changing about being in those spaces and how that culture was being developed based on how I was being coached and how other people were being coached, the words that were being used in those spaces, okay? The relationships, et cetera. So what I did was say, I need to begin to explore this, right? So about two years ago, I was very lucky and got a grant, an $80,000 grant from a local foundation in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, that focuses very specific on, justice, on issues of social justice. And I put in a proposal that said, I want to develop a program that looks at coaching language and how we can reduce sexually violent language in coaching, because it's there and it's happening. And sort of the, the breaking point for me, I guess, was I was coaching a field hockey team with a friend of mine at a local high school in Guilford County, North Carolina. And field hockey and football are in the same season. And on our field, we have this little field over here off in the corner. And then the football team has two different fields, right? So what we have in this situation is the head football coach standing on a platform with a bullhorn, is that what you call it, like a megaphone, right? screaming at these players using sexually violent language and I, I'm thinking he's trying to motivate them, right? So it's like all of a sudden all these bells went off in my head and I'm thinking to myself, if the athletic environment is truly an extension of the school day and kids are there to learn things, this is unacceptable. We can no longer have school sanctioned events 
whether they are between 8.30 in the morning till 3 o'clock in the afternoon or 3 o'clock in the afternoon till 7 o'clock at night when that final whistle blows, these have to be safe educational spaces where learning is taking place. So I wrote this grant and I said, we need to teach coaches how to do this. And I think in the long run, right, we're gonna reduce the amount of sexually violent language and it will help not to normalize this, this way that kids are being coached and the normalization of derogatory and violent language around women's issues. So what I have here for you today is an analysis of some of the work that we did with this program over two summers with 154 coaches in North Carolina. Those of you that are gonna go through the program this afternoon, the workshop, you're actually gonna get the workshop. This is what we learned from the workshop after two summers, okay? So I wanna give you just a little bit of a backdrop here. What was our foundational belief? I talked about this just for a minute. High school athletics are an important aspect of the school environment. How many of you agree with that? To embody the educational values instilled during the school day, coaching language and the messages being delivered to motivate and communicate with high school athletes in practice in competitive settings should be instructional in nature with word choices that are free of violent language, derogatory messages, and the normalization of sexually violent acts. Now, how many of you have been on a team, have been coached, or do coach? Okay, now, you don't have to raise your hand for this, but how many of you have ever heard another person in an athletic environment use some kind of language that was sexually violent in nature to either make a point challenge you or motivate you. It happens all the time, doesn't it? This kind of normalization is extremely problematic. I focus really with high school athletics, but we're seeing that this is threading itself through. The elimination of this kind of language, it's threading itself through all the way to the top. What did the NFL recently come out and say for the fall season? that penalties will be imposed to players on the field if they use homophobic language, racial slurs, sexually violent language, and other forms of inappropriate language. You will be penalized. Guess how many yards? 15. 15, okay? So this is threading through. People are starting to see that this is a problem and the way we communicate in these spaces has to change. Now, my work with this particular project is on sexually violent language because a lot of what I study, well, the primary, my primary area of research is, sexually, is sexual violence in athletics, okay? So this is what we believe, and so this is kind of where we started. Our partners on this particular project, we worked very closely with the North Carolina Coalition Against Sexual Assault, the North Carolina High School Athletic Association, and of course, faculty and staff, graduate students and undergraduate students from UNC Greensboro. We really aim to enhance the leadership role that coaches played in eliminating the normalization of gender-based sexual violence in athletic settings via the creation of an educational program for high school coaches in North Carolina. When we started this program two and a half years ago, we had no idea how far it was gonna go. And it will be presented for the fourth time this year in Boston at the national level. So we thought this was a statewide project that we were gonna do, it was gonna be great. We were gonna help enhance athletics and improve athletics in North Carolina. We had no idea that people would be so interested at the national level, okay? so. These were our partners, these people right here, especially NC CASA and the North Carolina High School Athletic Association, they were critical partners for us, okay? I wanna just kind of give you a snapshot of who are the 154 people that were a part of our training, okay? So who's coaching high school sports in North Carolina? Just kind of an average here. The summer that we worked with them and we gathered this information that I'm gonna present to you, by the way, for the first time today, I just finished this analysis, but with qualitative data, you're never really done, are you? 
I'm gonna look at it again next week and I'll have to send you an email. I forgot to mention this, I found this this time. So we had 154 coaches. The average age was 41 years old. We had 98 male coaches and we had 56 female coaches. On average, the coaches that we worked with um, have 12 years of coaching experience. 92% of them reported that they were going to coach their sport the following season, and 40%, 47% of them reported that they coached more than one sport at the high school level. Okay, so a lot of coaching experience in there. 100, um, 107 of the coaches have a four-year college degree. 134 of them report having uh, some uh, teaching license or certificate in North Carolina. 75 of them reported that they have a degree in exercise and sports science slash kinesiology. And 40 reported taking a college class, a co excuse me, a coaching class while they were in college. Uh, 36 of the 154 have a master's degree and 112 of them reported that they had some kind of formalized coach training. Okay, and what we basically found out, we dug a little bit deeper on this, um, what they meant by that was they have some kind of online learning certificate that they got from taking online coaching classes. Okay, so they have some other kind of formalized coaching training. Um, on average, these coaches, the 154 of them, were reported spending about 24 hours a week engaged in coaching while they were in season. How many of you coach, currently coach? How many of you think this is pretty accurate, 24 hours? How many of you think it's a little bit more? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I thought that was a little conservative. On average, um, coaches report that their seasons last about 18 weeks. Okay, so this really is just sort of a snapshot for you of who participated, who we worked with when we first did this workshop. Okay, so how did we develop this curriculum? We have two very great partners. How did we develop this workshop? The first year, we, took, we asked stakeholders and experts from UNCG, the North Carolina Coalition Against Sexual Assault, the North Carolina High School Athletic Association. We sat down and we tried to really flesh out what we needed to teach, what's important. You have a group of coaches in a room for an hour. You want them to stop using sexually violent language. What are you going to do? What do you teach them? And how do you do it? In a way that's very applied and in a way that's going to make it accessible for them. Right? Something that just kind of can roll off the tongue. So we did that. We took that initial curriculum that we all worked through. We delivered it to about, set, we piloted it to 75 coaches in North Carolina at different coaching workshops in the summer of 2011. Okay? Then they did all these evaluations for us. And in the academic year of 2011, 2012, we went in and we revised the entire thing. So based on their feedback and suggestions of the coaches, these 75 coaches, we changed a lot, okay? In year two, this is where, and this is how we got to where we are. This is the presentation that you'll see this afternoon. We revised the curriculum, and then we went back and we presented it to the 154 coaches in the summer of 2012, okay? Um, we developed a final program based on their feedback, so we did another round of revisioning, and then we, based, we put the final program training online in May, okay, last year. So this training is free of charge to all North Carolina coaches and athletic directors, and to be honest with you, I guess it's really free of charge for anybody who wants to access it because it's online, the videos are up there, the tut everything's there, so if you wanted to access it, you could. Um, but this is basically how we came to develop the curriculum, which is going to be important for you to know when I start to talk about outcomes. And how do we know if it worked, right? So we can develop these programs, but how do you know if it works? How do you know if those coaches, when they leave that setting, are going to walk away and say, yep, I know how to do this, I know what to say if it comes up, and I'm not going to use this language anymore, okay? So, what we talked to them about, just a little, I want to give you just a little hint here of um, some of the things that we did talk to them about so you have some context when I start to talk about the outcomes. We, t we said, well, what's the problem? You know, so we talked to the coaches about this. What's the problem? Sexual violence is a societal problem, right? 
Sexual violence exists in many domains and spaces. Athletic and sport is only one example. One of the things that was very important for me, because I do love athletics, is I don't want anybody to the, that goes through this training to feel like we're attacking athletics. You know, it's bad, right? I don't want anybody to feel that way. We need to make a change. There's got to be an adjustment, which will only make the space better and safer, okay? So the other example that we often give is music. How many of you are listening to music that has references to sex, sexual violence, derogatory messages against women? How many of you have ever heard music that, that has those words in them? Right, so this is not an athletic problem, sexual violence, this is a societal problem, but because of who we are, what we study and where we sit, we're in the best, we're in the best places to make an impact in this area, aren't we? Right? This is a societal issue. It's not an athletic issue. Something that's ingrained in every, a lot of different aspects of our lives. Right? So I think that this is the, one of the most important things that I point out to people when I give this workshop. The other day, um, the program that I run at UNCG just had a phenomenal opportunity. And um, are you, do you all know about the IWFL? It's the Women's Independent Football League. It's a semi-pro league for women. You do? I'm glad. It's an independent, it's an uh, independent semi-pro foot tackle football league for women. Insane how strong these women are. So they asked me if I wanted to play and I thought, what? Because I can't play, right? Because I pride myself on being tough. But if I took one, I'd be down. That'd be it. So my entire self-identity would be out the window. So <laughs> I wouldn't get up from a hit like that, right? So I bring this up because um, the program that I run, we just negotiated a contract with this league to be their research arm, which we're very excited about because we'll begin some of the first concussion work very specific on women athletes because it's, it's not out there. Women athletes in concussion this is going to be a huge area for us to, to tackle, right? Did you get it? <laughs> tackle. Okay. So anyway, I bring this up because on Saturday night, I'm at one of their football games. There are 31 teams throughout the country, by the way. Women's tackle football. And they're an organized league. Semi-pro. I'm at one of the games in uh, Durham, North Carolina on Saturday night. And the CEO is a friend of mine. And she also, she's also a player for the Carolina Phoenix. So I'm sitting there, right, listening, halftime. This music comes on. We all play music at halftime, right? You should have heard the music. One of the first conversations I'm going to have with her when I go home is, what are you doing? That language was, this is a woman's league, a woman's tackle football league. And the music that was happening at halftime was all against violence against women. So. We have to be aware of these things, right? This is a league, think about this, empowering women, ta women who tackle each other, 300 pound women who tackle each other. This is an amazing space for empowerment issues, but at halftime we're playing music that is violent and it's derogatory towards women. So it's, this is a big societal issue, but because of where we sit, we can change this just by changing our framing language and just by changing the words that we use when we communicate to our athletes, okay? Some research suggests that sexual violence is rooted or roots in power issues and entitlement, okay? This is the case too for sport, right? We know about power and privilege in sport and how, those, how that may lead to increased levels of folks feeling like they're sort of untouchable in these spaces. Okay, so power, this is one of the things that the sexual violence research has in common just with sport in general. Why language? So we know sexual violence is a problem, well why language? Why is that the road we chose to go down? It's one of the most fundamental aspects of coaching. Think about when you coach. Raise your hand, remind me how many of you coach. Think about when you coach or when you've been coached, right? More hands went up for that. How much would you have gotten done 
if, you're, if your coach wasn't talking to you, instructing you, or directing you? I can give you a hint, not much. I had this experience last summer. Through the U.S. State Department, we worked with the University of Tennessee in the Center for Peace Sport. I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, I'm going to mess up their name. It, yeah. So we worked with them and Sarah, and we brought in a group of female Pakistani field hockey players. They stayed on the UNCG campus. I have no idea how to communicate with them. So I thought to myself, this is going to be a really great challenge for me to work on my nonverbal coaching. Well, that's true, right, this idea of demonstrating. But when you're trying to explain tactics and things like that to people, you kind of do need how, to, you need how to speak to people. So I got it. This was a great lesson for me that language is a critical aspect of coaching. Demonstration's only going to get you so far. If you're trying to teach tactics and the reason why you have to move into that space, you've got to be able to talk. The Pakistani female athletes that we had at UNCG last year through the U.S. State Department Empowering Women Grant, Thank goodness they already knew how to play field hockey because I'm not really sure that they would have learned much from me. Um, language, powerful, yet often overlooked in terms of possibilities to create change. It helps to create the culture of a team, right? How many of you that have participated on athletic teams had like a key word or saying that represented your team? It was like your team motto or your team slogan, something like that. It creates a culture, right? It creates the culture of your team. Language also establishes a tone. And language, of course, can be verbal and nonverbal, OK? So we've got sexual violence is a problem, language. How do we get to these coaches? We had this running list in that first year that we were working. So, probably 30 things on that list that we could have done with this grant for these coaches in North Carolina. We chose language because it's the most fundamental aspect of coaching and it's the thing that can be fixed immediately. Okay? So, how does sexual, how does language, now we're going to put those two slides together, how does it contribute to sexual violence? Some statements lead us to believe that women are weak and men are strong. Also, some allow us to believe it's okay for men to have power over women, which may include influence and persuasion, physically overpowering someone, and confusing the boundaries about what is right and wrong. It allows us to think that sexual violence is not serious, normalized, and it allows us to think that if sexual violence happens, then it is, it's something that the woman did to bring it on herself, which is not true, right? This was our curricular outline. So we took all that information and we said, okay, we need to break this down, right? Coaches are applied people. They are practitioners. We need to give it to them straight. How are we going to do it? We developed a, cur a curriculum that had three sections. What coaches need to believe, and that goes back to this right here. You need to believe that this is a problem and that you have the ability to fix it. We need to know what coaches need to know, right? So if you hear someone on your team use derogatory language when they come off the field or even on the field, how do you address it? What do you say? How do you fix it, right? How do you say, that's really not what you meant to say. What I think you meant to say was this, okay? And what they need to be able to do. Recognize those skills, not allow it, not use it, address it when it happens, okay? All right. So these are our curricular objectives. In the short term, we wanted to develop an educational program for coaches that increased the role that they could play in stopping gender-based interpersonal violence among their, their athletes. For us, it was changing their language. Our long-term goals were these. And you'll notice that these are in red right here. This is where we collected our data. Did our program work? Did we make a dent? Are we now seeing that coaches feel better about being able to do their jobs and that they know how to use instruction and not derogatory language to motivate, challenge, instruct, and teach their athletes? Okay? So we wanted to enhance the leadership through our training, enhance the leadership role that North Carolina coaches can play in reducing this kind of violence. Expose, examine, and reduce the tolerance of this, not allow it, and reduce this use of language by athletes.
okay? Those were our three main objectives. So we went into this, these trainings, first the pilot training, made the adjustments, and then we went in in the summer of 2012 and gave the first real sort of presentation of this with the, the revisions that had been passed to us from the coaches from the summer before. So these were our three big areas. Did we teach what we said we were gonna teach, right? That's the, pro that's the foundational question of anything. Did we teach what we said we were gonna teach? The results, how many of you think we did? Yes, yes all of you raise your hand. <laughs> we did. We did. We found that our coaches learned what they needed to do in their language to reduce gender-based violence and how it normalizes itself. Here are some quotes. Change can happen. We can trigger it. Collectively, we must be willing to stop this type of language. So you see, they're starting to assume the role. We've said it's a problem, it's a societal issue. Athletics, though, is not, we frame this as that athletics is a space where inherent leaders naturally come to the top. That being said, if you agree with that, coaches, then you are the perfect people to change this culture, okay? So we can see that they're starting to assume ownership of this information and they're, 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 start, they're gonna make some changes around this and their, their team and their environment. One, uh, several coaches just told us, I can stop this. This doesn't have to be said on my team, I can stop this, okay? Our athletes are always watching us. Be careful with our words and be willing to communicate differently. I can take this information and pass it along to other coaches in my school and my districts. So they're assuming ownership. That leadership role that they were looking for, they got it. We said to them, you're the coaches. Coaches, by their very nature, are leaders. Don't you think? They are. What are you going to do about this? Okay. The next one, how can we get this tolerance that happens of the normalization of this language to stop. Coaches, what are you gonna do about this? If you're the leaders, what are you gonna do about this? So they go through a whole program and then this is what they tell us. I will tell other coaches when their language is inappropriate, okay? Um, I will use the examples that were presented in this training about how to correct language. Um, I, they learn phrases that they can use to stop the language when they hear it. They can redirect language and teach athletes about violence, the violence in their language. The athletes may not be aware. Okay, so I want to stop right here and give you one really concrete prime example. And one of the things, one of the biggest things about doing this kind of work and talking about this is you have to know who's sitting in front of you, right? So what I'm about to say, ha it's offensive. Um, this is data that we collected from the North Carolina coaches, and we have found that it is particularly true with the lacrosse culture in North Carolina. A lot of times when athletes, lacrosse athletes, and other athletes, not just lacrosse, I'm not picking on lacrosse, but we found this with a lot of lacrosse coaches were reporting this. When we talk about this idea of their language and their athletes may not be aware of it. Here's a perfect example of the normalization of one of the most heinous sexually violent acts that someone can, can experience. Players coming off the field, coaches going into the locker room and saying, man, we're getting raped out there. How many of you have ever heard coaches say this? Normal, right? What does it really mean? If your coach is in the locker room with you at halftime and they say, man, we're getting raped out there, what does it mean? We're losing. Yeah, we're losing. Why wouldn't you just say, we're getting our, you know, we're losing. <laughs> what are you going to do about it, right? Why do, we have to, why do we have to take one of the most horrendous acts of sexual violence and bring it into our locker room? and it happens all the time. Kids coming off the field because they've been taken out of the game, throwing their sticks on the ground and saying, man, I just got raped out there. 
well, you ask an athlete, well, what does that mean? What it means is that someone was playing, you know, they figured out how to play you on defense and you can't get around them, right? Problematic. These kids don't even know what they're saying. Because if, in fact, they had just gotten raped out there, I think that going into that locker room would have been a heck of a lot different for them. They have no idea that what the, it's normal. It's become a normalized part of the culture. It's not appropriate, right? This is a problem. Other coaches said when they could uh, examine, expose, and reduce this kind of stuff, if you hear it, acknowledge it, and do something about it. And our curriculum breaks it down this way. What do you say to stop it? What do you say instead of it? How do you teach the athlete about it? Number three, um, how do you affect athletes? How do you now, as a, as a teacher, right? So let's say you're a math teacher. You're teaching kids how to add and subtract. They leave your classroom in second grade. Now they go to third grade and they have to be able to multiply. They're going to take what they learned from you in second grade with adding and subtracting because you need to know how to do that when you multiply, don't you? How are your athletes going to take what you teach them and carry it along? Change it, right? So you go to the coaches who are the role models, right? Coaches are role models. You go to the coaches and now you say you have to make an impact. You have to make sure that your athletes are taking this with you, taking this with them, what they learn from you. So this is your next big thing. How are you going to get the athletes to acknowledge this and use it? So the coaches told us, until you teach athletes to sit and talk about this, they may not be aware of it, and they just will accept it as normal language. You have to teach athletes to be responsible for each other. Don't use this language as a motivational tool it is clearly not, it is sexual violence, okay? So this is what we can, so we really feel, I feel good about this curriculum. I feel good about what the coaches learned from it. I feel good about it. They got what we wanted them to in the hour workshop when they were in front of us, okay? Now, some of the other things, because if we go back to this slide, you may remember these were the three areas we were really focused on. But then all of a sudden, I'm going through all this data, pages and pages, 300 pages of data, right? I'm going through it. It's taken me a year to go through it. All of a sudden, so I have my areas set up, right? These three areas all set up on this big Excel sheet. I'm, I'm, impressing myself as I add more things to the Excel sheet, right? But then all of a sudden I have this column over here that's starting to develop. And I'm right now, at that moment, last winter, I was calling it outliers. And so when I took a harder look at it this spring, it, they weren't outliers. What I figured out is that they learned more than we had intended. And that these outliers were clumping into these four areas definitions of what sexual violence actually is. They were, they were learning about challenging norms. How do you challenge norms of sexual violence and sexually violent language within an athletic culture? They were learning the prevalence of it. How many of these coaches are actually talking like this? And they also learned that it's a problem. So we took these other areas, and so what I've got to do now is that's what I mean by quality. How many of you are qualitative researchers? Just when you think you're done. You go, you're like, this is spectacular. I'm going to present this. I'm going to write about it. This is great. Guess what I'm going to have to spend part of my summer doing? Going through all of this now. But isn't it great? You know, when you really look at it, isn't it great? Those coaches took more information away from that one hour than we had planned for and what we taught and what we, than what we planned for with our objectives and what we had intended to teach them. You can't ask for more than that. Imagine if students in your classroom did that. How great would, like they did the reading, <laughs> right? Tell me something you learned in the reading, right? It's a victory, isn't it? Raise your hand if you're a faculty member. If the students do your reading and you have some kind of bonus question on the quiz, what did you learn in your reading? You feel pretty good about it, right? They learned, they got it, I get it, they get it, I'm so happy. Okay, 
So this is now a next step for me, right? And by the way, did I mention this is the first time I've ever presented this data? So I'm very excited about maybe I'll come back next year. And I'll show you this. OK. Uh, curricular e efficacy. OK, so here's the big thing, right? You have coaches for an hour. You give it to them, and then what happens? They go away. How do you know if it sticks with, in the moment they can give me an evaluation, I learned this, this, and this. I'm like, thank you. But when they leave me, they leave us, a year later, are they still using it, right? This is a big problem. But it, it is the problem with all issues around curricular efficacy, okay? So we did a little bit of follow-up with them. They don't respond. What's the number one reason why coaches won't respond or follow up? I'm too busy which we get a lot, I get it. So how do we know if they're using it out there? Two years after the fact, a year after the fact, how do we know? This is a work in progress. The bottom line is I don't know. Can I tell a granting agency and put in my IRB for my research plan? I'm gonna follow up with them. I'm gonna send them postcards, I'm gonna do this, this, and this. Yes. Will it get approved? I hope so. Will those coaches send it back to me? No, maybe not. Maybe 24%, because what I don't write in my IRB and what I don't tell my granting agency is that at least 70% of these people are going to respond a year later. I have no control over that, right? I can't do that. It would be, I mean, I'd be digging a big old hole for myself. So it's a work in progress. We asked the North Carolina Coaching Association to do a little bit of follow-up for us. What we found was that 74% of the coaches who attended um, our last formalized workshops before they went online, um, they reported that they were using part or some of the curricular training when they worked with athletes. Um, the most impactful learning goal that was reported was that coaches were now able to recognize sexually violent language and that they had higher levels of efficacy when addressing the language. But we also don't know how often. So if you're coaching the, the swim team and you hear something and you address it, but you're, then you go out and you coach the baseball team and you hear something and you don't address it, what do you, I mean, what do you do, right? Because a high portion of these coaches are coaching, 47% are coaching more than one sport. Does it carry over? Does the language culture of that team matter, right? So I might, I'd be more comfortable talking to my swim team, but not with my baseball or softball team. I'm not going to talk to them about this. They're not... They're not those kind of, they, they can't hear that, right? So we don't know. This is a really hard part about this research. We also know that the North Carolina High School Athletic Association is collecting some information on athlete violence, uh, athlete sexual violence in North Carolina, but it's a little, it's perpetrator based. So it's, you know, if an athlete commits this act and the person goes to the coalition for help kind of thing. So we're getting a little bit of that, but the efficacy of this it's a work in progress. And if anybody has any suggestions about programs that you've developed and how you've handled this, you know, we definitely, I would love to hear about this. Would love to talk to you about that. Okay. So this is where we are. Um, comments, questions? Yes. Oh, really? Thank you very much. I really like it here. I've never been here before. And I had a great time. I met these two nice people last night at dinner. It was great. I've loved it. It's been great. Okay. I hope I can. Oh, like yeah. Yeah. I think you're, you raise it. Yeah, you raise a good point. And so one, we, and I, you're right. You're absolutely right. One of the challenges is for me is if I could do that, I would see what I've also, I didn't talk about this, but the coaches that come to the trainings every summer in North Carolina are different. So if all of you came in 2012, you wouldn't come back in 2013. Yeah. I agree with you. I agree. Well, and we know it's, this is a problem. It's, it's as more light is sort of shed on this and that it is a problem. The next project that we're taking on um, with the same foundation in Winston-Salem that focuses on social justice is one of the things that I didn't mention in this presentation is 
an analysis of the data also strongly indicates that the sexual violent language, sexually violent language that was being reported is also homophobic. It's very homophobic in nature. And so the next project that we're starting on in the fall is developing a curriculum that's similar to this, but addressing this idea of homophobic language. I don't know what will overlap, I'm not sure, you know, but um, we have got to address this use of homophobic language in sports. The same way that we use sexual, not we, they, people that live outside of our worlds, use sexually violent language to challenge and motivate athletes specifically around masculinity, we cannot also allow that to happen with homophobic language. It's not appropriate. And like I said, I work with high school athletes, so contextually I can make a strong argument that this is inappropriate. It's an extension of the school day, this should not be going on. I coach field hockey, I'll tell you a story. I coach field hockey. Coach field hockey forever. I love high school field hockey. If I could make a living doing it, I would. Let me tell you, we were uh, on a trip going to Asheville, North Carolina to play a field hockey game. It's three hours from Greensboro. I get to the school and find out the coaches have to drive the vans. Oh, that sucks. It did. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna drive the van. Well, I'm, it's one of those, it's, we, there are three coaches, three vans going to Asheville. Three hours, play a field hockey game, turn around and come home. So I'm driving down the road and it's one of those vans that has like the DVD players in the back. And I hear that like the, the players in the back, I've known them forever. Like I've coached them since they were in middle school, right? They're watching the show. And in the show, like I can't, he, I, he see it, I can only hear it. Well, in the show, this girl gets raped. And I'm like, what in the world? So I turned it off and I said, what are y'all watching? Gossip Girl. Well, I've never seen that show. I watch The Big Bang Theory and I go to bed. <laughs> so they're watching Gossip Girl. And I'm like, okay. So I turned it on for another minute just to listen. Well, that episode ends and I'm thinking, what am I going to do about this? Three episodes of Gossip Girl? No. So in the next episode, the girl who got raped falls in love with the guy who raped her. This is me. Eject, right? Because the DVD is in the set in where I'm sitting. And they all freak out. And I'm like, I try, I'm having this conversation. You should not. What are you watching? This is not appropriate. Well, it's just, it's fake. We know it's not real. I said, it doesn't matter. This is a school sanctioned trip. You're in a van that's owned by this school. Do you really think I'm gonna let you watch this nonsense as you prepare for a field hockey game? No way. Well, and I have a really good relationship with all of them, right? I turned on that satellite radio, listened to Barry Manilow the whole west of the way to Asheville. I was like, you're not gonna, no one's gonna swear at each other, no one's gonna get killed, and no one's gonna rape each other in this song. Trust me. Well, then you know what happened was the other vans were so stacked with equipment and other players, they wouldn't get back in my van to come home. So I had to switch vans and drive all the equipment home. Fine with me. But I did kind of feel bad, but they didn't get it. And so the next day, well, when we got back to practice on Monday, I said, do you understand? Some of them did, some of them didn't. And I then, okay, so to make the story worse, went to the athletic director, said, Freddie, what are you doing? If you're going to monitor the music that's played at warm up and halftime and have these kids turn in the lyrics to these songs to make sure it's not offensive or violent, you have to do the same thing with what they're able to watch on these trips. You can't be listening to, you know, this great music at halftime, but then be able to watch a girl get raped in an episode of a TV show in the back of a van on a school sanctioned trip. It doesn't make any sense. So I went on this huge campaign to get like parents and other people to donate like nice movies. <laughs> that movies that don't have violence in them and movies that aren't gonna, where women aren't gonna get hurt and other people aren't gonna get hurt and they're not gonna swear at each other and things are, are not gonna blow up, you know? Like Matilda, do y'all know that movie Matilda? <laughs> That was my idea. Listen, they've still not adopted, but I really believe this is true. It's an extension of the day. So because I work in an athletic environment in high school, and that's my focus, 
If I were to have this conversation in a professional environment, in a collegiate environment, it'd be a different conversation, wouldn't it? It would. College, you could, I mean, I could definitely make the case for, I think. But high school, it's a slam dunk. Right? What other questions do you have? Yeah. Do you, um, I know that you said you focused a lot of your study on high school. What about the elementary level? Not, no. I've not ever, I've done some work with youth sports and I've done a little bit of research around volunteer training for, uh, or training for volunteer youth coaches, youth sport coaches, but nothing like this. Yeah. No. Oh, sure. So, and it's kind of hard because, you know, they might know that language is being normal at home. Right. So when you're, like, when they're in your supervision and you're trying to tell them, like, that's not right, and then they go home and they just, like, counteract everything. It's I, you're right. I, and you're right. That normalization that comes from other places and the kids bring it with them, you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a huge challenge, right? But you raise a good point. I've never thought about doing it in a youth sport environment like that or you know a recreational environment like that but it sounds like there might be a need yeah well, okay yeah um i don't know how to say this can you turn that thing off for a minute um no um no i haven't uh i did i used to do sport parent education um and what I basically have determined um, is that you can't change a person's value system in a 45-minute workshop. And the people who don't come to those workshops, uh, they need it the most. Yeah, but just say, like, for instance, in what you're trying to do and everything you have going on and the coaches that participate, can't they have like say a mandatory meeting where they go through a similar workshop and make the parents be responsible for that and go through that education if they're gonna if their kids gonna participate yeah I and I know that there are youth sport organization on the country that take that approach um, I you know in terms of teaching parents about sports personship and you know side you know and Florida soccer leagues with silent Sundays and things like that I think you know those ideas have been they've been instituted in, in different places around the country for sure could you do the same thing with this sure you absolutely could the I think the biggest challenge that you have with sport parent education period is that parents sometimes have different agendas for why their kids are participating that may not meet the mission of the league or the coach right or the values of the coach or the league and um, I think that those conversations are extremely difficult to have um, especially if people have other ideas about what should be going on for their kids in those spaces um, I um, it's so nice that your department chair uh, said that I could come back. There was a time when I was never invited back, and that was sitting in front of a, a group of sport parents when I became the least popular person in the room when I was asked to give a talk for parents about the byproducts of youth sport participation, and I started my talk with this, which was a mistake. It was a rookie mistake. I'd never start a conversation like this again. But I stood in front of all these parents, packed auditorium. I thought, wow, spectacular. I started my conversation with this. 90% of your kids, 90% of them are not going to play college athletics. Oh. <laughs> exactly right. Huge mistake. Huge mistake. I, I know, right? I'm in that 10%. I'm in that 10%. <laughs> Listen, I, my, I, may, I was a horrible, horrible mistake. Listen, I was still a doctoral student, so I had a lot of learning to do. That's, I'm going to chalk it up to that. I'll never start a conversation like that again. They stopped listening to me. Some of them left. In hindsight, 15 years later, I probably would have been like, what if she doesn't even know my kid? You know, I mean, how does she know? But, I mean, so it's... It, I don't know. I've never, and ever since, and I've tried to do things with them since then, but 
I do know that parents have their own ideas, thoughts, and values, and it, a 45-minute workshop may not get done what you really need to get done in there, so right? Done with that workshop in 10 minutes? Well, can I do what? Are you done with that workshop in 10 minutes? Well, that was actually a talk. It was like a formal talk. Um, I was just going to talk about like the byproducts of youth sport participation. Kids going to be more cooperative. They're going to be better, you know, all these types of things that they, you know, that in the late 90s, those were the conversations that we were having around youth sports, right? Any other questions? Yes. Now, along the lines of like family values, things like that, are you, do you anticipate, I know you're going to start sort of tackling homophobic language, mm -hmm. do you anticipate more of an issue with talking about not necessarily you, but getting a message across with homophobic language versus uh, sort of gender or, or, or more gender things? Right. I don't know. Right. And I think those values, they're still prevalent, they still exist, but they're not necessarily, uh, it, it, it's, it's more taboo to say something like that. However, many family values are still centered around being homophobic. Sure. Either through the religious values or, or whatever. And you raise a, I mean, a great point. And we're start, I'm starting this in a state that, you know, had an opportunity to allow for gay and lesbian couples to be married last November, and they voted it down. Right. right? So... You know, this is, you, it, you raise a great point, but we've got to, I, I don't know. We still have to, I, I think you still have to combat it. I think right. Really I just don't know if you have certain Not yet. Uh, the only reason, the only thing that I know is that a lot of the data that we collected, the statements, they, it, they overlap with homophobic language, and it's problematic. So, you know, some people say, well, if it overlaps, you know, just add it on to this. It's a different conversation. This is, it needs to be talked about a little bit uh, differently. I mean, I coach football and I have had like both, both types of language used for my players on, against, either, against women or against, uh, against homosexuals. Right. I'll talk to them about both. Um, but research I've looked at regarding masculinity and football would indicate that, yeah, they're, they're very different. I mean, uh, for, for a boy to establish that he is Dom, he's, they're two different categories. Right. That I'm dominant over women, and they're two, they're very different things. But boys, even when you ask them about it. And that's taught through the culture. Right. Right? That's taught. And so that's where, you, I mean, you have to, but actually, this goes back to your point, right? Do you start it younger with youth sports? Because that's taught very, I mean, my nephew, I, my nephew was playing football, and I had to wonder, what's he going to learn? Is he going to learn, what's he going to learn besides how to tackle somebody? football a lot of them drop out because they don't they don't enjoy it because if they're not as masculine as the other people they feel like they don't fit in right yeah is my time up hit that burn out yeah. i think uh, dr Duncan will be around for questions after yeah though, if, uh, around all day, of course, and, into this afternoon. and tomorrow thank you thank you so much for coming today